Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of Combat Sports, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how was Thanksgiving? Yeah, no, it was great. I, I mean, thank God for Elaine, my wife, because <laughs> it's just another reminder of how much better they are than us um, in many ways, <laughs> in many, many ways. Not just in a way that they can have a child and we can't, and they can deal with that pain and everything else. Um, but they deal with a lot of other things day in and day out that sometimes they don't get credit for, you know? Um, yep. And they should always get credit for it. Uh, like cooking for 30 people, 25, 30 people, whatever the heck it was, and a bunch of kids. Uh, it was it was great, great for us. Uh, I don't know about her, you know, because uh, she barely, you know, she was working all day. She was up to like, three in the morning cooking the night before and preparing after doing it all day the day before on Wednesday. And then, you know, but a lot of people, if you're fortunate enough to that this story sounds familiar, well, go out and after Thanksgiving, you better buy something special for your wife because uh, otherwise that turkey might not be there one day. Because, <laughs> you know, for, uh, you'll uh, be the turkey. <laughs> yeah, for, again, for all those people... Uh, but again, we were so fortunate to have who we had there. My son and his family, my grandson flew in from Vegas. They stayed here for the dinner, for the foundation dinner. They stayed. They surprised us, said, okay, we're going to stay longer. We're going to stay for Thanksgiving. So that made it special. Uh, we had uh, my son-in-law's family, Michael's brother and his family, all of their kids, which makes it special too. And of course, my sister and her family, uh, my I'm trying to make sure I don't leave anyone out. My cousins, uh, friends, a few friends. You know, uh, we we had uh, Nicole, of course, and uh, and uh, like I said, her husband Jeff and their two children, our grandchildren of little Mara, little little uh, Joseph. Uh, one's three, one's five, and then little Teddy the fourth. He's four. So, and all the cousins playing together, you know, it was, and, you know, every once in a while, small little argument, that's okay, uh, you know, amongst kids, but because uh, we didn't, uh, Papa wasn't smart enough to get the same toy for all of them, which, you know, you'd think I'd learn that lesson somewhere along the line, that you have to get the same toy, not different toys <laughs> for each kid, but... um. We're, we're very blessed. It was a reminder of how lucky we are to have family, to have friends, and uh, to have, as I said, for me to have a wife and for them to have a mother uh, that is that selfless. So it was tremendous. Uh, the only bad part is always that little negative of, you know, it's called poundage, you know, um, because uh, where you'll do all that work to lose the weight, it's a lot easier to put it back on, you know, and Thanksgiving is a good way of doing it. Uh, we, my wife's a good cook. We, I mean, even homemade cranberry sauce. Wow. Um, and, and the stuffing and the sweet potatoes and, the, and the mashed potatoes and the turkey and the gravy and the stuffed mushrooms. Oh, forget about it. I, I, I'm not, I'm no longer at exactly 30 pounds less. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to work at it a little bit to get those couple extra pounds. I have to drink some of that diet soda, some of that natural soda uh, that I have here in the house. Olipop. Olipop. I have to drink more of that. I have to have some more of the athletic greens and all that. But I'll tell you one thing. It was fun. It was fun putting on the Don weight. Uh, and I'm not as... I'm not as practiced... Uh, and as smart as you are at hiding those couple extra pounds. By, uh, <laughs> no, really, because, I mean, you're in great shape and all that, and we get it, but you go and you get a haircut after Thanksgiving, and if people <laughs> concentrate on that. They don't look at the belly then. They don't look and see that, yeah, even Ken Rideout had a little extra gravy and a little extra sweet potatoes and an extra mashed potato and a little too much stuffing. Very smart, very well done, Ken. Um, really, I might have to get a haircut, but I still got to diet. I'm still going to have to diet. All right, guys, want to take a quick minute to give a shout out to today's sponsors. First up, AG1. 
as you know, they've been with us from the beginning. Athletic Greens take this every single day. Super easy to consume. You mix a scoop of it in a little bit of water, shake it up, boom, you're done. I never miss a day. It's got all the like probiotics, prebiotics, nutrients, vitamins, minerals, et cetera, et cetera. It's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients. ingredients. So even if you're eating the healthiest diet, it's a huge help to make sure you're supplementing with all the vitamins and minerals that your diet may not have on a day-to-day basis. Basically, Athletic Greens is like an insurance policy for your health uh, immunity system, especially in the, day, in the age of COVID and all the change of seasons here. I take it every day. And if you go to athleticgreens.com, slash atlas right now you can get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase these things are invaluable to me i travel with them everywhere i have them in every single bag that i use to travel i've been traveling a ton but most important to take when you're traveling so athleticgreens.com slash atlas promo code atlas you'll get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase check them out please athletic greens also want to give a shout out to one of our newer sponsors, Olipop. Get it popping with Olipop. <laughs> I hope they like the catchphrase. But Olipop is a new kind of soda. It's one of the fastest growing functional beverage brands in America. Two out of three Americans say they suffer from some form of digestive digestive issue. Olipop is excellent for gut health. It's got a ton of uh, plant, plant fiber. It's also got prebiotics and, and botanicals. This ginger lemon flavor is one of my favorites. Only two grams of sugar compared to 39 grams of sugar for a can of Coke. Um, Just an excellent healthy alternative to traditional soda. I'm a huge soda guy, so this stuff was like a blessing for me. It's also something I feel good about letting my children have it. The kids love, if your kids are like mine, they love soda. This is something I can let the kids have occasionally and feel good about it. So check them out. All, drinkolipop.com use the promo code atlas atlas for 25 percent off your first purchase again drinkolipop.com use the promo code atlas save 25 percent on your first order of with at olipop anyway i want to before we get into breaking down the fights and everything i wanted to say that we heard you we heard you what is teddy talking about right now i had mentioned a few weeks back that I had obviously been covering the UFC, the tremendous card at the Garden for ESPN, and my buddy Stephen A. Smith was over there, and he had said, hey, Teddy, I want to come on your podcast. Um, And then after we mentioned it, and he was nice enough to say that he wanted to come on the show, you people, the fans, you know, you really responded. I mean, Rob said that, we were kind of like inundated uh, with all kinds of great, great messages saying, please get Stephen A on. So guess what? We listen, we hear, and we do. And we're going to have Stephen A on. We're not sure exactly when. We're going to try to do it before Christmas, somewhere before the holidays, uh, the next holidays hit. But I'm going to have my man on. And uh, I know that people... Are kind of looking forward to seeing that and and please i the only bad thing i feel about having Stephen a on is that people right away they want to see us fight <laughs> you know oh, what i've I mean? already got my referee jersey like right away they want to see okay you're gonna fight with him we listen i love him um and he's you know he's just he's a guy that i admire a guy that i uh appreciate and uh yeah we might fight a little bit all right we might fight a little bit i don't know i'm not sure but we're gonna have him on uh not to fight but to talk to converse um to share the brotherly love that we have and um to make you guys happy so we'll do that the other thing i want to mention real quick over the holidays it actually cultivated last night um we we do this on Monday. It gets up on Tuesday. So Sunday night, it cultivated UConn, the University of UConn men's basketball team. Uh, I had mentioned a while back that I went up to speak to the team and their tremendous coach, Danny Hurley. You know, he comes from, well, he comes from royalty. You know, his father was an iconic high school basketball coach in Jersey City that turned... Uh, 
a high school there into a well, he turned it into two things. He actually turned it into a basketball factory for kids to get to Division One basketball and get that education and get not obviously a chance to play Division One and also a chance to go into the NBA even after that. But what he really did over there was he took kids from very difficult backgrounds, tough areas, and he turned them into young men. I mean, that's really what he did, uh, as well as really good basketball players. Well, guess what? His son, Danny, is doing the same thing up in UConn and with the same formula as his father. And, of course, his brother, too. You talk about basketball royalty. His brother, Bobby, was one of the greatest guards in the history of college basketball, won a couple championships at Duke, and... Would have probably, I, at least in my estimation, a lot of people's estimation, probably would have went on to be one of the great NBA guards, maybe of all time, quite frankly. But he had a horrendous car accident uh, for all intents and purposes. Probably, <laughs> if he wasn't as tough as he was, he probably could have, would have, almost should have died. I mean, it was a head-on collision. Uh, they thought he was going to die. He lived, not only lived, he came back and played in the NBA, which, you know, he never had the career he would have had, but it was incredible that he could come back just a testament to his fortitude and to what he is. But Danny, I think right now that Danny Hurley, I, I know I talked to the team and I became friendly with him, but I think he's the best coach Ken in college basketball right now. Anyway, he's got UConn undefeated. I think they ain't no. They just won a championship uh, tournament last night. They finished up in the finals last night uh, uh, to win it. They had beaten Alabama, a uh, top rated team in the top 20 on Friday night. And they won the championship last night. I think there's many more for them to come. I was really proud of them. I was just excited because I know what I know what Danny's all about. I know what he I know that he recruited these kids as basketball players, but he chose these kids for their character. And it's really showing. It really is showing. Um the 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 way they play as a team, the way that they're coachable, uh the way that they care about what they're doing, uh, everything, all of it. Yeah, they know how to play basketball, but they also a learning and every day on how to be the best people they could be. And I think that makes you a better basketball player. I'm sorry. I think it makes you a better fighter too. Uh, and I think it makes you a better coach. When you actually are invested in the young people's, the benefit of them as a person or the development of them as a person, not just an athlete. Yeah, the athlete part is huge. I get it. But also the person part. I think kids... They get it. They they feel it. They, you know, they they can understand that. They have enough of uh, intelligence to know when somebody cares beyond the athleticism that they actually care what they're going to become as a person. I think that's going to make a kid go to the wall for you. I really do. I think, and they go to the wall for Bobby Hurley. I think they're gonna. I'm making a prediction. It's early in the year. They're going to win the national title. How do you like that? How do you like that? Wow. How do you like that? All right. They just Get your bets in. They just broke into the top 20. Um, I don't want to put more pressure on them, but look, I guess what I'm basically saying is I'm proud of him. Um, I'm proud of the what he's doing with that program that had fallen off a bit uh, before Danny got there, and I just wish him luck. Uh, I really I stayed up late last night to watch it. It was in Aragon. It was the Phil Knight tournament. You know the guy that Phil Knight Legacy tournament. Yeah, the guy that started Nike. He made a couple of dollars over there. You might have heard of Nike. <laughs> you know, you, you see the facilities. These still the facilities they have at the University of Oregon. They have probably the best facilities in the country. A uniform for every game. I mean, Crazy. back when I was a kid, when I played college football, you had to give your jersey back so they could use it the next season. These kids have a jersey for every single game, different uniform every game, helmets and everything. They got more than that. That's they the got my son. <laughs> I know. My son was there for scouting the the Oregon football team, so he knows the facility very well. And he told me, he said, yep. "Dad, unreal, unreal." All you need to know is this: in the 
in the press room and in the locker rooms, they have Ferrari leather seats. Okay, you need to know anything more. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I don't think you need to know anything more than that. They got a pretty damn good facility. And uh, anyway, let's go Huskies. Let's go Huskies. Let's go Dillian White and Franklin. What do we got? What do we have? Okay, Dillian White gets the uh, gets a, a narrow decision over Jermaine Franklin, who I'm pretty sure shocked everyone in the boxing world, including um, Dillian White, by showing up not to p- behave as an opponent, but to be in there in a tough life and death fight back and forth with Dillian White. I thought it was a great fight, super entertaining from a layman's perspective. I thought that Dillian White would try to load up on some shots here and there, and he hit he hit Franklin with some body shots that I can't believe that the kid absorbed all night. Credit to him. He had an iron chin. He'd get he'd get touched with big punches and just come right back with a nice crisp uh, combination of his own. He had White. Uh, I, I don't say he had him in trouble, but he definitely had him in a fight. And uh, Dilly White gets the close decision. But, man, Franklin's, uh, Franklin's stock is up. If nothing else, he's probably earned. And I know you've mentioned on Twitter that um, Franklin definitely will get some more fights because of this. But just for context, for people that don't know, when Andy Ruiz took that last-minute fight against Joshua when he upset him, I want to say he made about $5 million for that fight. So when you get a guy like Fran- Franklin, who was in t- – who was in, he gave, he gave White a good fight, but I don't think he's a threat to knock out any of the um, – top heavyweights but he's probably the guy that they're going to want to fight if they're looking for something that is in a um you know tight odds let's say and god knows that boxing certainly has their fair share of uh soft touches let's say franklin probably earned himself a couple big paydays in the future with that performance how'd you like it yeah no all of the above um and i did do a, as i do for all the fights i try to do with my tweeting team brennan ian and rob we, we got those tweets up there and um, that you just referred to. And a lot of times I, I get fans. The fans will say, I don't need to watch the fight. I, I follow your tweets. So that's, you know, I'd still watch the fight if I was you. But that's, that's nice for people to say that they get a pretty good idea of what the heck is going on with the tweets. And sometimes uh, a little something they might not always get from the commentary, especially this commentary when it was when it was English based and I don't think they gave enough credit uh to Franklin. I mean uh, you know, it's I'm getting used to this kind of stuff, but over there across the pond, love all my brothers over there, love yous, you know that. But and you love your heavyweight boxing and you love your boxing in general, especially the heavyweight. But I didn't think that the commentators were really fair to Franklin. I mean, Franklin was in that fight. Franklin could have won this fight. Here's what it's all about. Franklin could have won that fight. That's how well he fought. But in reality, and you get a dose of reality here. That's what you get here. You know, this is realville. It's That's where we live. And you don't get that everywhere. But you're going to get it here. Reality, Franklin could have stayed home and never got on that you know, international flight to go all the way over there to London across the pond, and he would have had the same chance to win from home on his couch as he did there. What did you say, Teddy? I said it, yeah. I said it. I said it clear. Because the reality was he was never going to get, because this sport is is not fair. It's not honest. It's not. And when you're with the promoter, when you're with the power, And especially in this case, you're over, you know, you got one fighter coming from across the pond, another one who lives there, and he's the one, in this case, White, with the power, with the promoter, and in the background, in the background, you have a White Joshua fight for millions of dollars that's already being prepared, already being touted. Again, I say it again, you didn't hear me? Okay, I say it. I say it a little crisper, a little clearer. Franklin could have stayed home and had the same chance to win the fight as he did going all the way over there to actually participate in the ring. The only good thing is, yeah, to Ken's point, he helped himself. He is now a play in the heavyweight division. He is now, his stock went up. He is now a guy that people know about. 
He he's no longer you know an unknown quantity. He's now a quantity that's known. He he was a undefeated, uh, inactive fighter that was untested. Now he's been tested. Now he's proved that he can play with the big boys, and now his promoter. Dimitri Salida will get a chance to maneuver him, to put him into some meaningful fights and have a chance to make some more noise in the heavyweight division. But it's sad. It's sad when we just accept that, you know, yeah, uh, and we move on. Yeah, he, he, he didn't get it. He didn't get a, a, a fair shake. It's damn sad because there's no other sport that consistently, at this level, does that to its athletes, to its participants, in this case to its warriors, who put so much on the line, who risk so much. They come out of that ring so often with less of themselves than they went in. And that's why I, I go on the way I do. You know, that's why I don't have a job probably, uh, quite frankly, on, on the network anymore. But it's okay. It's okay because the truth is important. It's important to continue to put it out there. Continue to bang away with it. And again, the truth is, he had no... He had a, That fight, he had about as much chance to win that fight, no matter how good he was. And he was good. Unless he knocked him out. Unless Franklin knocked out Dillian White and, and didn't get disqualified for doing that. Unless he did that, Ken... He had about as much chance as me getting to Mars without a spaceship and as, without a spacesuit. Uh, you, I mean, uh, you, you're talking about a majority decision to make people feel better. Okay, one judge had it a draw. It makes every, and that, I have no argument with the draw. I have no argument, to be clear, if you said that you want to give it to White by one point or if you said you want to give it to Franklin by one point or two points. No problem. No problem. But to have the other two judges give it 116-112, that, again, to my point, he never had a chance. He Because they weren't going to let him. Because they knew, they knew who had to win. It was already mandated. It was already scripted. He's fighting Joshua next. A guy named Franklin ain't getting in the way of millions of dollars that are going to be made in that fight. No way. No way. Here we are again. The same old, same old. Yeah, Franklin fought a terrific fight. Yeah, he showed up. Yeah, he behaved like a fighter. Didn't only fight like a fighter. You know, all of that. Um, yeah, he got tested. He survived the test. Everything else. But at the end of the day, yeah, boxing reared its ugly head. Yeah, its ugly head once again. Because there is no way. There is no way if you're going to be honest about it that you're going to say that 116, 112 was appropriate. And, and you know, I love the way they do it. They do it with, they do it with um, latex gloves where there's no fingerprints left. Yeah, that's how they do it, Ken. Where they, they make it a draw. One guy has it a fair decision. That's fair. Nothing wrong with that. And then they make it with two. So people say, oh, they had it close. No, they didn't. As, like I said, it's about as close as you're going to get to Venus. Uh, I mean, that's how close they... It was... No, they didn't have a close. You, it, takes, it takes only two judges out of three to, to win a fight. So if two of them are on the side of the power, you have no shot. Yeah, it looks good if, if it's a split decision or majority decision. Oh, you know, that was close. They understood it was close. That was fair. No, it wasn't. It wasn't fair. It wasn't close. It was never going to be an opportunity for the huge underdog to win this fight, no matter how well he fought. So anyway, uh, getting that out of the way, I'll break the fight down. Uh, Dillian White, bigger, even though he was not as heavy, um, but bigger, bigger, stronger, the more experienced guy by light years to Franklin. And... He goes, he's got a new trainer in Buddy McGurk. And one of the things that I was confused about, I got to be honest with you, in the fight with Buddy McGurk was 
a former world champion, good trainer, obviously, but during the later parts of the fight, he says, this guy, meaning Franklin, of course, is looking for a way out. A way out. I thought he was looking for a way in. I thought that he was always looking for a way to win. I, I Now, I get it. You, you want to tell him what he wants to hear, whatever. But again, I, I just, I don't think there's any replacement for the truth or anything more important or more powerful than the truth. When you tell your fighter, when you tell your fighter in this kind of business, in this sport, that the other guy's looking for a way out, you are implying that the other guy is going to give up. You're implying that he's going to make it easy for you. He's going to capitulate. He's going to cooperate. You're implying he's going to quit. That's what you're implying. So you're also putting, it's a mental game, 75% of it's mental, Ken. You know in red running. What would happen if somebody kept whispering in your head, don't worry, this guy's going to quit in front of you. Who's running? What would happen? You'd be waiting for him to quit. <laughs> it would hurt you. It would affect you. It would impact you. You wouldn't push yourself as much because you'd be waiting for the cooperation. I think it's a mistake in life in general when we teach people, whether it's our fighter, whether it's our kids, Whatever it is, when we teach kids and people that it's okay to depend and to look for someone else's weakness for us to be strong, I think that's dangerous. I think it's irresponsible. I think it's reckless. I, I think it's dangerous. And so when you're in a fight and you're telling a fighter and you're the captain of that ship as the trainer and you're telling a fighter he's looking for a way out, Again, same thing. You're saying you don't have to be ready uh, hitting on all eight cylinders uh, as far as where you should be hitting on all eight cylinders, where you're always prepared for a guy to give his best. You're always prepared to overcome something. You're basically saying you don't have to be prepared for that. You don't have to be prepared to overcome something. You, you just have to be here and the guy's gonna, he's going to do the rest. He's gonna he's gonna cave in. He's he's gonna he's gonna give you the victory. You that's again, you're implying that. You you you're saying that. And so now instead of your charge, your fighter always being, you know, stout, strong in the areas, you know, of resiliency, of of fortitude, of being ready to overcome something, be ready for the worst. Be ready for the battle. Be ready for the onslaught. You're telling them they don't have to be ready for that. And we always have to be ready for that in life. We all, sometimes it does become easy. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes it becomes an easier fight in whatever you're doing than we thought it was going to be. But you should always be ready for the hardest fight. And you should always be in charge of yourself in that area. That you have a responsibility to push yourself to the utmost. Prepare to the utmost and push yourself and be ready to go to those places, to be ready. You're basically saying you don't have to be ready for that. And when you tell somebody that, you're telling them to be less than they should be. I, I, I was just, I, I, I'm always shocked when I hear, it's not the first time I've heard in a corner. It's not the first, it won't be the last. But I tell you, every time it affects me, it impacts me. It makes me say things like this and and go into these tirades, if you will, uh, about such things. But at the end of the day, Dean White, bigger guy, Buddy McGurk was telling him, rightfully so, back him up behind the gym. The only thing he didn't add to that, I, I thought, was, okay, you back him up. What do I say all the time? You go and set the table with the jab, and then you go eat with the other hands. I, that's the only thing I would add to it. That, okay, you're backing him up behind the jab, now go eat. Go eat a little more. It seemed like Dillian White was satisfied. Almost like he knew the script. Like, like he was satisfied just to do enough to control a little bit and not really an urgency to go any further, to go to that other place. And I, I, it just seemed like, and that might have helped keep Franklin in the fight. It might have, but at the end of the day, yeah, Dean White did some good body work. Dean White had a good jab, a long jab. 
I thought he could have done more on a consistent level, but he did enough to make it a really close fight. He landed a lot of telling punches. He did a great job with the right uppercut, especially late in the fight. I mean, somebody's got to teach this Franklin, you know, if he's going to go to that and stay at that next level and succeed at that next level, he's got to get his head out of the middle. He can't lay his head in the center there, Ken, where he's going to eat those uppercuts like crumpets. You know, he, he's he's got to get the head over or block it with his glove. But that's, that's something he can work on, something that he needs to work on. But he showed a great chin. He showed great heart. Um, you know, and he showed that he wasn't satisfied with just showing up over in London as the underdog and giving a good effort. He was, at every second, he was trying to win the fight. And what you're supposed to do, but it's not always what gets done. So I give him credit for that. Um, I thought Franklin could have had a better strategy, to be honest. He could have helped himself if he separated himself. And where he could have helped himself also was to come in a little lighter, where maybe he could have used his legs more and stayed on the outside a little more, where he could have set up more counter opportunities. He had a few, but he could have set up, maybe walk right into more counter chances or counter you know, uh, punches. Um, I, I thought he could have separated himself a little bit where then his superior hand speed would have been able to work a little more freely. Because when you're in tight quarters, and Franklin stayed in tight quarters, he stayed right in front of the, the, the bigger, stronger white. And when you stay in there, well, you get bogged down. Your speed gets lost a little bit. And, and you get sapped a little bit of your energy to use that speed. But when you have separation, you have, you know, you got to know the... You got to know the geography of the fight that makes sense for you. And if he was on the outside a little bit more, he could have. His hand speed would have shown itself a little bit more. He would have stayed away from the bigger man getting sapped, and he would have gave up his body. You mentioned it earlier that he that Dillian White hit Franklin with some, oh, some tremendous, oh, I mean, really earth-shaking body punches. I mean, that make you lose what you ate for dinner the last two days, and. And Franklin, to his credit, he took them, but he wouldn't have had to take them, and he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have been worn down a little bit, which it probably did wear him down a little bit, if he had separated himself with the legs. So I thought Franklin could have been on the outside, used his hand speed, stayed away from the body attack a little bit of Dean White. It would have helped him a little bit more. At the end, it wouldn't have mattered. The the judges, I think, uh, I think those scorecards were were made up ahead of time. You know, and I'm I'm saying it joking, but but it's not that much of a joke, and it's not that funny if you're on the wrong side of those scorecards, uh, one sixteen, one twelve by two of the judges. I thought Franklin uh, put punches together better than Day and White did. I thought that his combinations were really good. Uh, you know, he didn't have the pure power uh, that White had. Although in the ninth round, if my memory is right, Franklin hurt him. If he had a little more time left, Ken, I think he drops him. But he didn't. It, it was at the end of the round. And then at that point, going into the championship rounds from the 10th on, I thought it was anyone's fight. Maybe Franklin even had a little lead. But credit to David White. Credit to White. You know, he showed up when he had to. You know, he 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 used that experience. He showed that heart. And what did he do? In the, in the last round, the 12th round, he hurt Franklin. He had Franklin badly hurt uh, at the end. But Franklin survived it. He went the distance. Uh, Dean White also pulled out some of those later rounds, you know, that, that definitely was important. Um, but... It wasn't enough to make it 116, 112. Uh, not to this boxing guy. Not to this guy that cares about the truth, uh, really. But a good, good, a very good heavyweight fight. Really good. The fans, I applaud you. They come out all the time. They came out. Dana White gets knocked out, destroyed. He he didn't even look like he wanted to be there. Like he had no, he, It's like he didn't even have a purpose of a plan when he fought Fury. I mean, it was horrible. Horrible. I mean, it's like... He, he had a plan. It's called, it's called payday. Maybe. <laughs> maybe, Ken. But he... I mean, he, he didn't look like him and his trainers... It didn't look like they prepared for what was going to be in front of him. A, a guy that was going to fight the way that 
It's like he had no clue of what to do for this particular opponent, which is, for me, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. But he got destroyed, and then he got finished with the uppercut in that fight against Fury. He got destroyed, but the fans still come out. I'll tell you one thing. They wouldn't have came out over here, and I'm not knocking the fans over here, but they, they don't come out for that kind of fight over here. Not that not the way, what was it, 12,000, somewhere in that area at Wembley Arena. And listen, don't get it confused with Wembley Stadium that fits 100,000 or 90,000. Wembley Arena, smaller place. But uh, it looked like it was pretty full. So I think it fits around 12,000 people. So the people, they come out, their guy, Dean White, gets just like, destroyed in his last fight it doesn't matter it doesn't matter to these english fans they're so loyal they really are and they love heavyweight boxing i mean they they don't care if you if you lose i mean whether it's frank bruno you know they always back frank bruno or joe bugner you know or, or joshua Joshua hasn't been doing too good his last few fights, right? I mean, the guy yep. the guy got beat twice in a row by a smaller man in Usyk, and they're all gonna come out. They're gonna they're gonna make Joshua and Dean White a huge fight. Me as the dollars. I mean, wow. They have a history of backing heavyweights, Ken. It doesn't matter. There, there was a, it probably started with Jack Peterson of the Dirties. I mean, he drew 90,000 people. Who drives? I mean, it's unbelievable. He drew 90,000 people for a fight uh, in, in London, and he never beat any of the overseas top fighters. Never beat them. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. They loved him. I mean, listen, he was a good fighter, you know, and he gave his all, but they loved him. Another guy that couldn't win at the next level, but they loved Henry Cooper, another one. But they didn't care if their guys lost and if they lost several times or if they couldn't win at the next level. It didn't matter. And, and again, proof, you know, exhibit A in a courtroom to that is here they're going to come out for Joshua lost his last two fights. Uh, uh, Dillian White gets destroyed against Fury, but they're going to come out. And they're going to come out with millions, you know, what's basically going to be uh, millions of dollars in that fight. What you think if you think if you think if Franklin like got serious and, and lost some weight and got really fit because he could have been a lot tighter he could have had his body dialed in and I think he the guy has like skills if he gets his I said crap that. together like Ken yeah I, I said that I mean yeah I just finished saying that he yeah you know he put combinations together he had the hand speed advantage he showed a great chin great heart um you know but. I just thought that he could have helped himself in that area if he got more, and maybe if he was lighter, as I already said, yeah. he he might yeah, have been yeah. able to separate himself, use his legs, stay on the outside, avoid some of that body attack, not make it so available. He made it very yeah. available uh, for Dean White, but to his credit, he he took it, he handled it, yeah. and he and he gave it. He took it and he gave it, he gave it right back. No, I agree. That was a good analysis on that heavyweight fight. Let's jump into the uh, Pro Gray Zapata fight from L.A. Um, and for everyone listening, please stick around at the end. We have a, a great conversation with Regis, about 45 minutes worth. Excellent conversation. But Regis Pro Gray stops Zapata in 11th round of a very competitive fight. Um I love this fight. I thought Regis looked great at times and uh, finally gets the stoppage there. How'd you like that one? He had a real war horse in Cepeda, an older guy, game as they come, uh, but not as physical. He didn't have the physical equipment that Pro Grace had, as much physicality as Pro Grace does. Um, not, he could punch a bit with the left, but uh, not, not as stout as Pro Grace is in that area. Um, but he's a very experienced guy, Cepeda, as I said, a very, very lion-hearted guy. And it was a very interesting fight. I thought early on, and, and you're going to hear it with the conversation, a very honest conversation we just had with Pro Grace, where early on, he even, he even confirmed what I'm about to say. I thought he lost the first couple rounds. I, I thought he was trying to get in rhythm, uh, you know, he was trying to get to where he needed to get to, where he could impose his will and his physicality on the other guy. But early on, the fight plan of Cepeda was what it needed to be, uh, to sit outside a little bit and look to pot shot and look to time 
Prograis with his jab. He found a little quirk in his armor where Prograis great head movement, but sometimes premature, sometimes from a little too far away. And Cepeda, to his credit, he was ready. He was he sat outside and pop pop. He used his. They were both southpaws. He used his southpaw right jab to time the head movement from a little too far away of Prograis. And it gave him a lead for two rounds. But then Prograis understood not just power, not just that he had a physical advantage, but it, he needed to use his jab. He's a smart fighter, and he's a complete fighter. And I thought the jab became so important for both fighters in this fight. Yeah, that power was going to show later, but and all that, but the jab was going to lead the way. The jab was going to get you to later. And the jab of Prograis at, at times was dominant. And it was so important, so important for him to close the gap later gradually and get to where he needed to get to to use some of those physical advantages I talked about earlier. Um, and he had the right fight plan to do that. Yep. Like you said, great interview. Stick around for that. But before we sign off, let's get a quick... uh, I want to get your thoughts on Tyson Fury, Derek Chisora next Saturday from England. Um, Not exactly a fight that people were clamoring for. Um, Derek Chisora has been around for about 50 years. It's the Brits. Yeah, of course The Brits are going to come out. They're going to come out. And then they're going to have their pints afterwards. But they're all going to come out. They're all going to come out. That's right. That's right. Here's what I think of that fight. Yeah, go ahead. This is what I think, Ken. This is what it's about. I know you could, we could break it down for you know twenty two ways to Sunday, but at the end of the day, there's just two things that this is plain and simple. One that and one thing that it's not. Number one, it's a pension plan for Shizora before he retires. It is, and it's a good thing. I want pension plans. I've been fighting for it for years. We never got it. It's a pension plan for fighters. It's a pension plan for Shizora, an old war horse who's who's who is really given his all for so many years. Um, it, it's it's the equivalent of giving someone a gold watch for their long and meritorious service to their job. Fifteen years. You know, um, where he's fought everyone, a total of 45 fights, and has given the sport and the fans everything that he's got every time he's entered that ring. He's been a war horse. This is Fury's way of giving him a nice parting gift. Um, I think it's great. No, really, I believe in it. Uh, But that's what it is. And the second thing that it is, it's an easy payday for Fury uh, against a 38-year-old guy who... You know, he's, he's, he's already beaten him twice. He stopped him the last time, stopped him. The corner stopped it, actually, because he was, you know, obviously getting to Trezor in a bad way. Um, so he's already beaten him twice. So uh, on paper, it's, it's not supposed to be real competitive. But I'd say this, having said that, Trezor gives us all He's got a fan-friendly style. He just comes and he comes and he comes with those looping right hands and left hooks and body shots and 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 everything. He just comes and comes. He better be careful for the uppercut of Fury, just like Dillian White uh, got finished by that. Uh, I think that's probably going to fit in there to work really, really well for Fury, the jab, controlling range, controlling distance, making interest or pay for every inch of real estate that he's trying to make up, make him pay for it, uh, and, and catch him with the uppercut as he comes in. The shorter man trying to get in, you know, with the bigger man. Um, the one thing that it's not, I just said it, I don't think, at least on paper, it's not a competitive fight. Uh, but again, Ken, it's a beautiful gesture in an off often ugly business and um over here in the united states i already said it nobody would watch it but over across the pond it'll sell out it'll make millions of dollars uh you know because our english brothers love their heavyweights which i've already documented and uh you know i again tresora i'd watch it having said see i say that i have to say the truth because that's my job. And I have to break it down along those lines. But I, I'd watch it because Chisora 
is never going to give in. He's always going to be trying to get to you. For whether it takes whether it lasts two rounds, three rounds, or 12 rounds. He's always going to be, and he's earned it. He has earned the right to get this gift. Um, and I applaud Fury for giving it to him. Uh, again, I shouldn't applaud too loud because he's getting a payday for it. But, you know, uh, and I'm sure that all the pubs nearby will also benefit, right? Just like you benefit at a World Series game or a, a Super Bowl where all the people that own businesses nearby, they benefit. People come to their business. I'm sure the pubs will do real well, you know, as I said earlier, with the handing out the pint, pints, you know. And, um, and then, you know, when it's all over, some crumpets and a pot of tea. Um, I love you guys. You know that. I, I have fun with you but uh, I, I, I love you guys. Uh, and I love Chisora, the way he fights. I love the way, I love the way that after he does battle, his code, his code of conduct and principles of behavior, his respect for the man that he just did battle with, the way he goes out and he gets like uh, cheeseburgers like five guy cheeseburgers or whatever the hell they have over there, and and he and he brings them into the dressing room, whether it was with after the Uzik fight, whether it was after the Parker fight, or whether it's after the uh, you know the uh, Pulev fight or uh, whatever, whatever guy that he just finished sharing the ring in combat with, he comes there and he and he sits down and and you know breaks bread with them. Uh, has bring some cheeseburgers. Wow. That doesn't get better than that. It don't get better than that. God bless you, Tresora. You know, go go give it what you always give it. You know, give it hell, which you will, and um, make the money. Make the money that this opportunity gives you to make. You deserved it. Yep. Well, with that, guys, please stick around now for a conversation with the great Rougarou Regis Progray. And we'll be back with you next week to break down all the action. Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideau, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, the great Teddy Atlas. And today's very special guest, two-time super lightweight champion, my friend, the great Regis Rougarou Progray. What's up, champ? Good, brother. All good, man. Waking up today happy with a smile on my face. <laughs> Attaboy. The Warren Buffett of boxing. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could say our friend, not just your friend. I think uh, that's fair. That's I fair. I think yeah. me and Reach is a friend that we spoke before his fight. Listen, first of all, uh, as Ken just said, congratulations on winning your second title right now. Uh, mm. Reach is the first thing I think of. Probably, maybe not everybody would think of this, but, and I'm sure fans would like to hear this. I know from my own experience when you're you're fortunate enough and good enough to win a world title, sometimes it doesn't sink in. You know, sometimes you can't quite appreciate it for what it is. And then if you're good enough, as you are, and, and fortunate enough to win a second title, sometimes that one could be a little sweeter or it can it can just be appreciated in a different way than the first one. Tell yeah. us just Tell me, am I on to something here? And just how do you feel? How do you feel winning your second world title? Well, yeah, I mean, so the first time, you know, um, I don't know if people know, but yeah, I didn't I didn't appreciate it, you know, because it was just like kind of easy. I'm not even gonna lie. Like I was a you know champion three years ago and then I won it and it was just like oh, like I went I really went right back to like normal life, regular life. And um, you know, it took me three years to win this one, to win a second time. So I definitely appreciate this one more. Um, but it really doesn't change nothing, man. Um, the hunger is still there. Basically, like after losing my title the first time, it just made me it just made me more hungry and just more serious about boxing. Um, I think that's the that's kind of what kind of clicked in my mind after the first time. It's just like I just I I always love boxing. I'm a historian of, um, of the sport, but I just I, I'm more serious about it right now. Like when I'm in training camp, I'm just I'm just a more serious person while I'm in training camp now than I used to be um, a long to like three years ago. Sounds like maturity, 
Like you, yeah, definitely you, for sure. Yeah, you, you needed time, like we all do, to to mature, um, mm-hmm. to grow up a little bit more, uh, grow into our skin, if you will, a little bit more. It also, what you just touched on, is nothing in life is guaranteed. You know, you you <laughs> you win that first one. It's never a guarantee you're going to get another one uh, or another shot. And I right. think that's where maybe the appreciation comes in too. That it took you three years to get that other shot and yeah. to to kind of think about wow you know you got to make the most of it um right right because nothing is guaranteed mm-hmm. uh the the other thing i i want to jump into now and to breaking down a fight for the people out there we had spoken a few months ago about a fight plan and that for me the way that the found, fight wound up going was pretty much in line with what we had talked about. I mean, you had a good vision of exactly what your opponent was, you Mm -hmm. know, a real war horse, uh, a veteran guy, a tough guy. um, Mm -hmm. And you you had a clear understanding of what the path would have to be to victory. Um, Did it did it work out exactly the way again we had spoken about this the way that you envisioned it no man you know like in, in, in boxing you know like leading up to the fight you you always sit in your bed and you always think about how the fight is going to play out in your mind you, you can you envision it a million times over and over and over again and you always envision all right how this fight is going to happen because you you envision my strengths you envision his weaknesses you envision his strengths you envision my weaknesses and you know, you just think about how it's gonna go, but the fight really never goes how you envisioned it. Um, you know, so for me in this fight, he was definitely tougher than what I thought he was. Um, I landed. I felt like you know, I always feel like that. Though I, I guess I'm kind of cocky and arrogant because every time I, I feel like when I hit, once I hit him, that you know I'm gonna hurt him. I always feel like once I hit him with a good punch, you know I'm gonna hurt him, and that didn't happen. And so with this one. Um, I had to. I definitely had to break him down. But one thing I knew about him was that he is um, mentally, he's he's weaker than me mentally, you know. And so I could take him into the deep waters, and that's when it's I'm gonna start getting him in trouble. So I felt like I did feel like those championship rounds. If it got to that, if it got to the championship rounds, then I was gonna start breaking him down, not just physically, but I was gonna break him down mentally because, and that's kind of what started happening. And I was thinking, I was thinking that in the fight. Um, like mentally, all right, mentally, he's getting fatigued. And that's kind of when I started picking it up. But, um, yeah, we, I mean, I felt like that I showed a lot of things in the fight and especially that uh, how I can switch my game plan. Because some things I just – I kept switching a little bit. I kept switching more and more, switching over to different things. And sometimes he, he caught on to what I was doing. Then I had to switch back. I had to revert to some other stuff. So the fight was – um, it, it I just I like my performance. Yeah, I think everybody probably did. Um, yeah. Watch watching it, I wasn't surprised because again we had spoken, we had talked about some of the fight and the details going into the fight and what it would take. And I remember I had mentioned to you that, and you were in full agreement that first of all, I mean anybody would see this that had any understanding of of sports and in this case fighting boxing you had a physical edge you you were physically stronger and you needed at some point to bring out that physicality edge um you know to impose it on him we try to impose our will on people we try to impose our physicality if we can and i thought you did a marvelous job i thought he did too to be quite frank with the jab i thought the jab was the most important element for both of us quite right. frankly, mm-hmm. in the fight, that, that it would set up your power later, would close the gap for you, it would keep him from pot-shotting you, keep him from controlling the edge of the fight, which is what he wanted to do. But mm-hmm. I also thought you'd have a great opportunity to back him up and catch him because he he likes to stand straight up and mm-hmm. he'll pull straight back. And you got him into that situation where you were able to capitalize on forcing him back and then catching him some clean shots. Right, right, right. Well, I was waiting for it, man. Honestly, look, like, start. so going into the first round, I knew he had the big power in the left hand. And he knew I had the big power in the left hand, too. So we both was kind of 
we both kind of was looking at that left hand the whole time for a few rounds. We, you know, two southpaws. I want to remind everybody, uh, yeah, you're both southpaws. Go ahead. Right. So we both was looking at each other left hand because we both know that we can, you know, we can we have power in the left hand. So sometimes, a lot of times, I'll jab and then throw off the hook and then jab to the body. He was doing basically we was kind of mirroring each other. We was doing the same thing, and um, I think. And, and I really felt this power. I think it was in the first round because I'm pretty sure he. I, I felt like he won the first round because I was trying to I test thought, I thought he won. So you're being honest. I thought he won the first two rounds, um, right. to be honest with you, with the jab and with his strategy of stand sitting on the outside a little bit and he was mm -hmm. timing you with his jab. He was, quite right. frankly, he was timing your head movement, which we right. had talked about that when you and me talked, where sometimes I think you make that head movement a little premature. A, right. a, and and he was experienced enough, smart enough, cerebral enough to mm -hmm. to kind of sit off the pocket a little and and just take what you were giving him a chance to time you with that jab. Then you got into your rhythm. Then you you know you started getting busier and you started to take control of the tempo of the fight. Did you see it that way? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely for sure. You know, and like I said, um, at first. You know, with the left hand, I know he was gonna be strong with the left hand in the first round. I, and really, when I felt this power, he hit me with a, he hit me with a hard body shot early in the first round at the left hand. He threw it kind of straight, hit me, and I was like, "All right." You know, I felt it hurt a little bit, so I was like, "All right." Then I I, I figured out, you know, how much power he had in that left hand. So at first, I was just kind of worried about that, but um, what I wanted to catch him with the whole night, I wanted to hit him with the fast one too. And um, he was worried about that because I was hitting him with a lot of jabs and it was standing him up. But I, I, what I was really planning on, I was I wanted to hit him with that fast one too. And, um, you know, it didn't come until the 11th round. I hit him a few times just with the – I hit him with a lot of times with the jab and then the two. But it wasn't the boom. It wasn't the one-two. But um, that last round, the 11th round, that's when I hit him with the one-two. And that's what stunned him. And, you know, that's how I got the knockout. Yeah, but it wasn't just that. You got to that place – where you got him ready. The great Sugar Ray Robinson said, used to say, you know, I got to dress him up before I take him out. <laughs> he, right, right. You know, he, he had a great way of saying things, and, which mm -hmm. a lot of the great fighters did. And you kind of did the same thing. You had to dress him up before you could take him out. It wasn't just that simple, you know, yeah. where you, you, you gradually wore him down. Right. And um, I, I'm talking about body punching. You did some pretty darn good body punching too that I think was part of you know uh sapping him a little bit of his strength late in the fight uh listen I believe in honesty is the best policy I I get right to it I thought I thought that you lost the first two rounds as we just talked about you started but your strategy was right but yeah I might lose the first call but I'm gonna get to him I'm gonna wear wear right. him down exactly. and yeah and but I tell you, I thought that the commentators were watching a. I felt like I was on Mars. I like they were watching a different fight because I'm watching this, and mm. I'm watching this experienced Cepeda, who's a very game like I called him before, a war horse, and mm. he's fighting the right strategies for him. He can't be. He cannot match your physicality. So he's right. staying on the outside. He's pot shot and he's doing what he's got to do. You know, in spots he's looking for that big left hand, mm. and. You got into rhythm, but then I, I'm trying to remember what round it was, but then all of a sudden you got into rhythm and then all of a sudden he he shows himself again. I mean, he's hanging around. He's staying in there. It's, it's, a, it's a close fight. It's a contested fight. It's a competitive fight. And then all of a sudden, in the, I think it was the seventh and eighth round, um, or maybe it was the sixth, but whatever rounds it was, all of a sudden... He he has a couple good rounds, and he's like reminding you, "Hey, this ain't gonna be easy." Right? <laughs> yeah, you know it never is. Uh, this ain't gonna be easy, and it's a it's a battle. It's a close fight, and the commentators were making it sound like it wasn't a tough fight. I just want to hear your your thoughts about it because for me it was a tough fight. You warmed down. You got him to where you got him to. You had to, you know, then you came back. I think he won the seventh and eighth, maybe. And then you came back the ninth and then the tenth was a big round for you. I believe mm -hmm. that's, if I remember. And then the eleventh, obviously, you finished up uh, the work. But 
I I was just confused by them thinking. I think what happened was they were they already had in their mind that you were stronger than him. You'd win the fight. So they were calling it like that, but the only problem is it hadn't taken place yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But talk about the because again, if you listen to the commentary, you thought it was like a walk in a park. I, I right. thought it was a low. I I thought it was any. It might have been a walk in a park, but man, <laughs> it was a tough park. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, I guess so. I I didn't see the fight. I didn't watch the fight. Yeah, I didn't hear the commentary, so I don't know. You know, I don't know how that went with the commentary and stuff like that. But um, I told my people, I was like, man, that was a hard fight. But I was, I'm the people I'm talking to. They said, man, you made it look easy. So I don't know. I don't know how to say. It. I, I like I said, I didn't see the, I didn't see the um the broadcast yet. So I I couldn't hear the commentary. I didn't, I didn't hear what people were saying. But you know, I told people like that was it was a hard fight. He hit me with some hard punches. You know, um, but you know, people I'm talking to today, they said, man, you made it look easy. So I don't, you know, I don't know how to explain that one. <laughs> I think you turned it into your kind of fight. You know, uh, uh, you got to that point. But mm -hmm. I tell you, it took some work to do that. I, oh, I don't sure. yeah. I don't think it was easy. I, yeah, I'll I, be I, honest. I had, to break them, I had to break them down mentally. Just like you, I like I like the, the, the Sugar Ray Robinson quote, you had to dress them up before you take them out. I like that. So that's kind of what I had to do. I had to dress them up a little bit, you know, and that's, and that's, I felt like going into the fight, I felt like that was the advantage I had that he was mentally, he would mentally fatigue, you know, not just physically fatigue, but he would mentally fatigue. And, yes. you know, that's what happened. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's how I got the job done. I, um, yeah, I made a note to myself. It was, I believe it was the sixth and seventh round. He, he had a good round. And then you responded with a, with a good eighth round and then a big ninth to, to basically take full control. And then, I'll tell you the funny thing. You're going to hear it when you listen to the commentary. I like to hear, see what you think when you do hear it. That I thought you won the 10th round. But the funny thing was the commentators all night, they, they got it like it's a foregone conclusion. You're going to go, you know, you're going to go through this, destroying this guy. <laughs> Where I didn't see it that way until it became, until it became that way. But the commentators actually thought Cepeda won the 10th. And I was like yeah. more confused than I even was yeah, yeah, up yeah. to that point. I was like, no, I thought you won the 10th. And then, of course, like I said, you took it from there right. in the 11th. Um, and like I also, I, I, I had spoken about this with you that, and, and you just kind of confirmed it, that, I just thought that the longer the fight would go on, you know, your pressure and your physicality would start to break them down. And right. um, obviously, you understood that and you felt the same way. Um, Ken, go ahead. You you go from here. A little oh, bit. I was going to say in the intro. Um, well, well, first of all, with the with regards to the fight, Teddy mentioned that um, some of the things you talked about with the predictability of the head movement. How often do you sit down with your own trainer? and watch your your fight from your uh, opponent's perspective and go through things that they may be able to pick up on your um, tendencies? Man, you know, I, I really don't do that, honestly. You know, if we're watching my fight with my trainer, I really don't do it. Sometimes I put on YouTube and watch my fights, but as far as with my trainer, I don't, you know, I don't, that's something I don't do. So I think I'll need to start doing that. That might be an interesting tool to use just to see what tendencies, if you were fighting yourself and look at yourself from like, try to remove yourself emotionally and say, what is this guy doing that I can pick up on? Like what Teddy was right. saying with the head movement was a good example. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I, th I think that people think that if you make the fight look easy, because even the commentators picked up on this and I agreed, you're so smooth in there and you look so comfortable in the pocket, especially even my, even one of my kids was like, Regis is so comfortable, even when the guy's throwing punches in it, he sits in the pocket and just moves his head versus overreacting to every punch. Yeah, yeah. That's a maybe, skill that I don't think a lot of people appreciate. Right, maybe so. That's why, you know, because, um, you know, like I said, it was it was definitely not an easy fight. And, you know, my friends was like, man, you made it look easy. I was just texting them just not in the group text. And I was like, man, I was like, man, it's a tough fight, you know. Um, you know, after the, you wake up to yesterday I woke up and I wasn't sore today I woke up I was sore so I just got in a cold shower and stuff like that to wake my body up and it was like man you you made it look you actually made it look easy and so yeah I guess that's what the maybe that's what the commentators was looking at because I'm you know I was dictating the pace and I was on um, I was in control I guess and and just being more calm and stuff like that just it make it look like you more in control than you 
Well, well I'll tell you one thing. I wasn't looking at that. I know you <laughs> I, wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I I was I I was looking at the future that you're going to wear the guy down because you understood what you needed to do and you were gradually doing it kind of like the analogy I would make sometimes during a fight where the if you're at the ocean the tide's starting to come in you know yeah. what I mean and before you know it uh, where you're sitting comfortable ain't going to be comfortable because right. the the water's going to come and get you and right, I right. felt I felt like you were the tide and you were the high tide and it was it was coming um you know sooner or later and and um and it did come but again i i have to say one other thing about the commentating where they actually made a comment one of made a comment i believe it was mancini the former world champion where he actually said the only way Cepeda can uh, what he needs to do is make this a dog fight a uh, firefight. I thought the opposite. I thought that Cepeda had the right strategy. He just mm. couldn't keep it up because, right. again, because of you, because mm. you took the air out of the room, quite right. frankly. You know, yeah. you took the oxygen away from him. You didn't let him keep it up. But I thought that was the only chance he had. I did not think that he could win. And I thought that's why it was a close fight because as long as he could do that, he stayed in a fight. But mm. once you broke through, to the place where you wanted to be, where you could really dominate physically with your superiority in those areas, then the fight was basically about to be over. And right. um, so I was, I, I think that part of that, is, again, is if you look at Mancini's career, everything was a dogfight. <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 I guess he figures, hey, if you're not in a dogfight, you're not in a fight. You know, right. like yeah. you, you, you're not, you're doing something, um, that's that's not right. But um, I think towards the end, though, Teddy, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Regis, I think your trainer saw it similar to the way Teddy saw it, that there were some close rounds and there were some rounds that went to Zapata. Because didn't, didn't Bobby tell you going into the tent, like, we need these last three rounds. We don't know how they're scoring this. Yes, yes, yes. Because, um, you know, it was getting it was getting up there. I was looking because I always look at the, the round cards and stuff like that. And so I think you, I saw Ted at night 10 and I was like you you what's the thing I was like I, I think I'm up right I should be up almost every round he was like I think you are but hey we don't know you know we are in California he's from here you know so he was like I don't yeah. know I also you know go out there and do what you got to do and then one of my other trainers was like hey bro don't don't fuck, don't lose this belt you know don't lose this belt so that's when I went out there he was like man just you know just box him and um, Bobby said the same thing with, I think Bobby agreed with Mancini was like, bro, he wants to get in a dog fight. You know, that's his chances to get in a dog fight with me. You can't outbox you. He wants to get in a dog fight. So, well, he had no um, choice at the end. He, you took the air out of the room and you didn't really have a choice, but right. when he had a choice, he was keeping separation right, and, right. and room for him to use what he had, which is his experience and his ability to time you with the jab in the left hand, which is, right. you know, he did um, in spots. And and I thought, again, thank God for honest trainers. And you have a couple because they're not all honest. Some of them just want to get along, to go along to get along. You know yeah. that. Where, mm -hmm. where oh, yeah, champ, you're doing great. Yeah, champ. And then when they announced the decision, you're looking at them like, well, what happened? How, right. what happened? How come the other guy didn't think the same thing yeah, that yeah, you've yeah. been telling right. Like right. all night long. So you have honest people in the corner. It's important to have honest people in the corner to tell you that because you could tell them I felt the same way. I felt like it was still a tight fight until you made it where obviously it, w it wasn't going to be tight anymore. Um, yeah. I, I got to ask, obviously, the obvious question, um, and this is funny because this is tied in again um, to the commentator a little bit. And, and now I know you can't wait to watch the damn thing so you mm. could see what Teddy's talking about. But um, obviously, what's next for you, you know, after you take a rest and um, you deserve the rest? And who would you like it to be next? And here's what I mean by the commentator. Again, the mentality, because that was his mentality, Mancini. He, he immediately said, oh, there's only one choice which I disagreed with, but he immediately said, there's only one choice for, for Reach's pro grace. He has to fight Josh Taylor, has to fight him, has to get that win back, has to revenge that loss. I, I, I'm, hey, I've been in the fight business 50 years, but I don't agree necessarily with that. Sometimes that's the case, 
But mm -hmm. I don't agree with that being the case right now. I think that you have other options out there, um, other other ways that you can go. Matter of fact, I think there could possibly be some interesting fights moving up from lightweight because, you know, guys like Garcia and Teofimo, you know, I don't think they're going to stay at that weight. And mm -hmm. um, so you could get some interesting action over there, possibilities for some big fights there. I just don't see you being having to be locked into Judge Taylor. But more importantly, what do you see? What do your people see? What's going on? Well, well, obviously, you know, I'm gonna let the I'm gonna let my the, the promoters and the managers do their job. Um, but I'm right now I'm the man at one forty. At my division right now, I am it's like I'm I'm D one right now. So it's a lot of right, big Chris. fights for me right now. Yes, it's gonna be a, a lot of big, big, huge fights for me right now. Of course, on my personal thing, if I would have to fight somebody, of course it'll be Josh Taylor. That's what I'll that's what I'll fight. But you know, he can't come he cannot come to the US. And I'm not going back over. I'm the cha I'm the I'm the, the the champion right now, so I'm not going back over. That's a fight of me either. And he can't he can't even come to the U.S. So um, that probably won't happen anyway, unless we go back to Dubai or something like that. But um, yeah, that's that's just who I would want on my personal hit list, just to get my you know just to get that back. But I don't. It's it's not a need. It's definitely not a need. To, I don't need to fight him at all. I have to fight whoever I want. Right? No, I agree. Yeah, I can, it's a lot. Huge, it's a lot of huge names out there. You have uh, Ryan Garcia and Javante Davis. They gonna fight. I can fight the winner of, of those two, the winner or the loser of those two. Um, my I have Tia Fimo is one of my mandatories for the WBC. Um, Jose Ramirez is a, is a mandatory for WBC. Um, they have the WBA out there. I think some dude named Puello has the WBA. I can fight unification, fight him. The IBF, somebody I think they're supposed to be fighting for the IBF. I can fight the winner of the it's IBF. It's vacant right now. Yeah, it's vacant, exactly. So I can fight the. I think they have somebody that's going to fight for it, and then whoever wins, I can fight. But I can fight them for the unification. So I have a. I mean, I have a lot of names I can fight. Uh, Josh Taylor is, you know, of course, personally, that's what I would want. But I have a lot of names, like a lot of big, big money names out there. So um, right now, well, well I'm talking. glad Mancini's not your manager. Put it that way, because <laughs> yeah, because exactly right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because otherwise, there'd only be um, one direction you're going, and yeah, exactly. and um, that would be about it. Listen, you're an articulate uh, young man and uh, smart. Uh, you you obviously are well spoken. Um, I I'm gonna put you on a spot and tell me. Who do you like in the Tank Davis Ryan Garcia fight? You just mentioned it. It's a fight that's on the minds of a lot of fans out there. If it happens, uh, right now we're not sure exactly we're thinking it's going to happen, but they're talking about tune ups and all that. So, mm -hmm. uh, two parts to that question. One, who do you think is going to win? Who do you like in that fight? And, and two, what do you think about tune ups when you have <laughs> a fight of that stature? Sitting yeah. in front of you, right, right, right. Well, first off, the the winner I, I picked Javante Davis to win. I think he's gonna win. Um, I just think he he's strong. Maybe too just too strong for Ryan. Um, that's kind of just what I think, and I think his man, mentality wise, I think he's probably a little stronger than Ryan mentality wise. One thing I Ryan does have for him, he has a a, a total hundred percent. He's confident in himself, so I like that about Ryan. But I still think that Tank is gonna beat him. Um, and then, yeah, with the tune-up fights, you know, I, I think they just, it's just about the money. That's all. Getting a little, getting another paycheck. Yeah, maybe it shouldn't happen. Maybe it should, but it's just, you know, it's all about just. No, I understand ahead. that, but, but Regis, what about the risk of taking that payday, you know, which is going to be a smaller that's one. Yeah, that's than true. The, that, exactly. Anything you know. can happen. You know, you know, we in boxing, anything can happen. It's a, it's not a team sport. It's a one-man sport. So, you know, it, it, it does risk. You know anything can happen. You get a headbutt or something. Anything can happen. So you know, I don't, I don't like that either. But like, I see where they're going with it. But if, I mean, that's just that's their situation. <laughs> Go ahead, Ken. Go at it. Oh, I was gonna say, people forget sometimes that with the Josh Taylor fight, that one one round, one round swing. One guy had it a draw. Another judge had him winning by one round. <clears throat> That one round goes back to you, and all of a sudden it's a draw. So that's for all the belts. So I think that people. I feel like you should be getting a lot more attention than you do get. You're, um, I, I think you make an argument for being in the pound for pound list with the with the performances you've put on. But 
who's your promoter right now? Like, I just feel like we don't hear enough about you in boxing, t- and I don't know why. Because, like, to me, I think you're one of the most exciting guys out there. Right. I don't, well, I'm with Probella, with Richard Schaefer, and them. You know, so now I think that listen, you know how you know how it is. After you take a loss and stuff, people just kind of sleep on you. You know, so yep. the only person that that's really gonna believe in yourself is is you. You know, I believe in myself. I told people at the press conference, listen. I like I can cry and all this stuff for the belt, but listen, I believed in myself. I knew I was gonna get this belt. This is no, this was no surprise to me. I I worked so hard for this, and I knew I was gonna get this. So I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised about this at all. So, um, yeah, the people, the promoters and stuff, maybe they don't believe in you, like, you know, they will think. But I'm pretty sure now they go to work. I, I feel like now that they're really gonna go to work. They're really gonna put my name out there everywhere it's supposed to be. Um, because now I'm a world champion again. Did it? I mean, I beat a killer in dramatic fashion. So I think that now that you know, I'm, I feel like I'm gonna get the respect I deserve now. Uh, that brings to mind this. Um, I don't. We're talking about a lot of. Ken brought up a good point. A lot of people don't know about Reach's progress to the level that I think you deserve, and they will know. They will know now. But to the point that you deserve for them to know more and along with that let the people know right now because i know this about you that you're not this sort of conventional um almost like you take top fighters like you most of them if you trace back the genesis of their career most of them started a lot of them started eight nine years old ten years Mm -hmm. old Right. That wasn't a case for Reacher's progress. You started late. Can started can you late, yeah. can you fill in the fill the people in on how you started with this sport, when you started, and you know I think they'd be interested to know that. And by knowing that, maybe they could really kind of understand how good you are and how incredible it is that you've done it uh, with a you know with a shorter background yeah. in the amateurs than than a lot of the guys right 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 yeah well so for me i definitely i definitely started late you know usually guys start um six eight years old start boxing around that age i started when i was about 16 17 so you know most of the guys had a, um most of the guys had a like a 10-year advantage on me and so for me i start i kind of started when i was um, like i said that age but i was in new orleans and i was i played football i played football i played basketball i played kind of all the other sports and stuff like that first and I just love to fight. Yeah, so growing up in New Orleans, you know, we just had to fight all the time. And for me, I always like to fight. That's something I like to do. Like, I can fight somebody and, like, my friends and stuff, they'll be fighting, but they'll be mad at the person. Like, when I'm fighting, like, I'm happy. I like to fight. And um, just even with the fight last night, not last night, on Saturday night, I was, um, like, I was smiling about it. I was happy being out because I, I just like to fight. So, um, and then, of course, um, Hurricane Katrina hit. And I was boxing out. I started by I, I really started boxing in New Orleans. So I started boxing in like May, and then Hurricane Katrina hit in August. So I only I was only boxing for a few months. Then Hurricane Katrina hit. Then I moved to Texas, and of course I had to stop for a long time because we was we didn't have a house. We was moving. We was living in hotel rooms and with friends, and you know in in Texas and stuff. So we you know um, we did that, and then eventually we moved. We moved to Mississippi. Then after that, we moved to Slidell. And then after that, we moved back to um, Texas. And that that's when um, I that's when I went to Savannah's Boxing Gym. And that's when I really started my amateur career. And ever since then, I just loved it. I was around. I mean, I was at that time. I was seventeen, and you know, I was around the Charlo twins and Vinus Motorosian and um, Irizarry Laura and Rigging Dow and Holyfield. At the end of his career, he was trained there. And Ronnie Shields was the Hall of Fame trainer. Ronnie Shields was the head trainer. So he was bringing all these guys. And at that young age, Oscar De La Hoya walked in the gym. Sugar, Sugar Shane Mosley walked in the gym. And so at that age, you're 17 years old, 17, 18, 19. And you're still a kid. You're still a child. And you see these people. Like I was, when I was, I think, 19 or 20, I was hitting the bag alongside Holyfield. And Holyfield is, you know, one of the greatest fighters ever. And I'm hitting the bag alongside him. So that just does something to my mind. It's like, I can do this too. That's kind of what I, that's what ran through my mind. It's like, all right, I can do this. Like all these great fighters are doing it and I can do it. And it just took, 
the is the main thing I, I realize is about consistency. Like a lot of these dudes, man, they all fall off. They they it's like recycle. They come in, they come out, they come in, they come out. And for me, I just stuck with it. No matter what my coach threw at me, I'm gonna stick with it. No matter what, I just did everything they 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 said to do, and I did more always. And um, that's how I'm, you know that's that's how I'm here now. Two times. How many time. amateur fights did you have, Regis? Because again, a lot of the guys we talk about, they had 150, 200, 250. I mean, that's the reality of it. How many did you have? I had about 100. Yeah. Okay, so you you made up some time then when you got started. But you got I busy because I because I had to. I had to literally fight every week. I, I wanted to fight every weekend because I was late, you know? So all these guys, they was in national tournaments and all that stuff. So every fight, I was trying to do one every weekend because I was, like I said, I was I was a late comer. I started, when I when I started at Savannah, I was 17 years old. And these guys been fighting since they were eight, you know, seven, eight years old. So I was coming up and I had to get as many fights as I can. I often talk about, yeah, you made up for lost time. I, you did what you had to do. I... I often talk, Regis, about, and I used to talk about it a lot on my platform on ESPN, now on this show, where boxing would save the lives of young men. Literally, right. save the lives of young men. Because if you get the right coaches and you, you get a kid, um, he gets direction, he gets confidence, he gets discipline in his life. That makes a difference between, quite frankly, living and dying sometimes and mm -hmm. and um, being a productive part of society. Would you say you fall into that? You, you made a nice point of talking about how difficult it was growing up in New Orleans at that stage in your life. Would you say that boxing saved your life? Um, I won't say it like that. It would save my life. Um, it definitely played a big part in my life. Like as far as saving my life, to uh, if I would if I would be dead alive, I don't think I, I couldn't say that. But change um, your life, change your life as far as my, oh, getting yeah, in course. a direction that, um, you know, a positive direction to uh, obviously for the people oh, for watching sure. me talk to you right now. I'm not just talking to a good fighter. I'm talking to a good person. I'm right, talking right, yeah. to a smart person. I'm talking to a person that has, you know, grown up in life to a place where they can be productive anywhere. You know, right. as as a father, as a husband, as a as a a man. Um, mm. Do you think boxing had a lot to do with? Getting oh no, you to yeah, that for place? sure, for sure. Because when boxing, you have is it, it just takes so much discipline, and if you can. Like, if you can discipline yourself to do what we do, like, you can literally do anything. And I really believe that. I, try, I definitely truly believe that. If you can discipline yourself to go through this, through this sport, because um, you have to be consistent. Like, every day, like me, I train, like, literally, I train every single day in camp, out of camp. This is, like, this is my job. Like, when people go to, they go to jobs, they go to their nine-to-five job, that's what they do. So, this is my job. This is exactly what I do. I train every single day. So, in camp, out of camp. Like I said, I'm always doing it. So you just, you just, you really, really need that in boxing. And if you have that in boxing, you if you take this same discipline that I have, you take that into anything else, or you'll succeed. You'll fly high, no matter what, because it, it just takes so much discipline, discipline and sacrifice and dedication in this sport. So I definitely feel like it. Oh, it definitely changed my life for for sure. That's why I advocate. A lot of people probably go like this, you know, they're headed to a cup, but I advocate where I'd like to see boxing programs in in schools. <laughs> I really would, because yeah. I think that it would help a lot of these kids get from point A to point B when they're having a problem getting there, as far as not always having fathers in their life, not always having proper guidance and leadership in their lives. I, I always felt that in grade school, you know, junior high school, whatever you want to call it, bef even before high school, that if you could get a boxing program and get more kids into it, you'd have a better chance of saving a lot of these kids, you know, uh, in, in a real way, in a way where they don't only learn academics, but they learn about life and they learn how to deal with life um, and navigate themselves better in life. And I, again, I think you're probably a, a good example of that. One last thing for me, one more prediction, Spence Crawford, if it ever happens, um, mm -hmm. who wins that fight? 
Don't know, don't know. That's that's really no, true, no, true, no. True. You can't do that. You can't do Listen, that. Listen, that's a picture. truly fifty fifty fight. I can say, I can say Spence, and I can say Crawford. I can say why, and I can I can give you a breakdown on why Spence, and I can give you a breakdown on why I'm Crawford. I just, I really, that's truly for me. I know everybody say fifty fifty. That's truly like I don't know who's gonna win that fight. I really don't know who's gonna if they ever fight, if they ever do. I really don't know who's, who can win that fight. Uh, you're in a courtroom. Make your case for why Spence <laughs> would win the fight. I think, all right, Spence will win the fight because Spence is the natural 47. He's been at 47 his whole career. He's naturally bigger. He's naturally stronger. His jab will stay in Crawford's face all night long, and he's going to he's gonna pressure him with the jab. But then, of course, he's going to go to the body. He's going to go to the body real hard. And defensively, he is responsible. Defensively, he – he doesn't he doesn't move like Crawford as far as like with the footwork, but he does he uses his elbows and stuff to catch a lot. He has long this go I you know, I fought Spence twice in the amateur, so this is this is very long. His whole his forearm is very long, so he can catch punches all the way up here and they're still blocked to the body. So um I can see that happening. Now on the other side, Crawford, I mean, he just like Crawford is an unbelievable fighter. I mean, all the movement, the switching, he has power and at the same time, Matt Crawford is mean. Like he just a mean, <laughs> just a mean ass dude. That's it. He just Talk a real, dog. He's a real killer. Like he's, you know. So I can, man, me, I can see both of them winning that fight. Yeah, you know, I can see a future in commentary for you. I can <laughs> see that. No, I'm being that serious. I can I, see I that. Few, I did a few of them before with um. I know you know uh, Smitty, right? Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a few with him before already. Yeah. Well, all of it is good practice because I, I mean that if if you were inclined to want to go in that direction when you're done with your career, you you could see that you'd be very, very good at that. I'll finish with just saying again, thanking you and saying congratulations for winning your second title, and good luck moving forward and defending it. And Regis really. Just for being a great example and uh, a role model of how a champion should carry himself both in and out of the ring. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'd like to just say before we sign off, um, for the people who may not know, I would just want to share some of the things that I've learned about Regis over the years and being friendly with him. We were uh, we both lived in L.A. at the same time. This is an eclectic dude with a lot of interests. I mean, we went, we went spear fishing together once. First time for me, Regis was into spear fishing and free dive, and I had a friend that was into it, so we went spear fishing. I've been to his house. He's got a library of finance books. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, man, no one reads that many books. And I say, you know, which one of those books is your favorite? He's like, oh, I like them all. I read all of them. And I'm not kidding. It was a library full of finance books, which is why I call him the Warren Buffett of boxing. He's got a ton of investments outside of the ring, real estate, venture investments. He's just an impressive guy. Is Wahlberg and Pete Berg still your managers? No, no, no. I'm still cool with them, but, you know, not as far as business-wise, no, not no more. But it was an interesting combination to see you chumming around with Wahlberg and Pete Berg. Mm -hmm. But uh, were you still training at Churchill when you were in L.A.? Yeah, every now and then. You know, I still um, I go to both of them. I go to Brick House Boxing and I go to um, Churchill. So usually when I'm here, I will do two sessions. I do the evening time, then I do the night time. So most of the time in the evening, I go to Brick House and I train with Julian. And then at night time, I go to Churchill. So I still go to both of them. All right. And what's your top finance book recommendation for the people out there? Uh, probably the the easy uh, something easy anybody can read like a rich dad poor dad that's like a start or like the richest man in Babylon that's probably that one first and then the rich dad poor dad. that's like two starts to because you can dig into that stuff and you can you can get lost in all that stuff but that's the that's the two like start offs you know that will get your your head thinking about that type of stuff so you confirm right there what I always say Regis uh, that to be a top fighter you can't just be good. You know, as far as talent, of course you have to have talent. We get it. You have to work very hard to develop that talent. But you have to be smart. That's right. what separates the special fighters, to be smart. Um, you know, otherwise, Customato used to say it in a very simple way. You just talked about the financial book that says it in simple terms. Cust used to say, Teddy, you got two tough guys, right? Uh, and they're both tough, but one is smarter. The scale tips way up in his favor. Right. Uh, he he suddenly becomes tougher just by being smarter. <laughs> right. So so um 
you just validate that point that uh, for the people out there, educate yourself, continue to uh, develop yourself in a mental way, all the young fighters out there, and read books. It can make you a world champ. <laughs> that, <laughs> all right, yeah. That, <laughs> And Regis, please get buy another Rougarou mask. That I couldn't. That, that's one of the most iconic names, nicknames in boxing. I love it. You got yeah. the uh, diamond medallion now. Please buy another mask. My kids were so disappointed when you didn't wear it into the ring. Yeah, I think yeah, you said yeah, you lost got, it in I Dubai. Gotta find it, man. Somebody got it. I, I must have left it in Dubai. I don't know where it's at. I got. I definitely got to get another one for sure. Hey, you know, Regis, they were speaking about reading, because when we talked, you told me you read a lot of books, and I think I gave you a couple to, to look at, or a couple of fighters to, to, to look at and to look at their, their, their history and their stories. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I may have mentioned this one, you may have read it already, but a guy who used to be very cerebral, great, 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 one of the great fighters of all time, and used to be known especially during those days because there was sort of like uh you know uh not a st i guess a stigma but um just sort of a stereotype of fighters that oh they weren't smart you know what i mean which of course right. was very wrong and gene tunney who was heavyweight champ of the world one of the great fighters mm -hmm. of all time he um he used to he used to read books in camp you know, yeah. he used to, and, and I remember the writers would say, I don't get it. Like, he's a fighter. Why is he reading books? But mm -hmm. um, uh, Gene Tunney uh, did what you did. Uh, he, he educated himself and developed himself from a mental aspect, too. So keep up right. the good work. Like I said, keep, keep teaching people the right way, not just to fight like a champion, but how to behave like one. No problem, always, of course. Yeah, thank you, Regis, and we'll look forward to having you on again when you have all the belts. Yeah, yes, sir. Of course, man. Thank y'all.